Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like I would talk a bit about bytecode. Uh, I know it's uh, it's after lunch, so it may be a bit uh, hard. Uh, I know I'm from Spain, so now it's it's the siesta time for Spanish people, so it can be a bit uh, it can be a bit hard. But I would like to put a disclaimer because uh, on all the presentations I put bytecode at the first slide, there was some bytecode. A lot of people left, so you have been warned basically. A bit about myself. Uh, I'm currently working at, at AXA. AXA is a big insurance uh, company based uh, the mobile center of, the, of development is based in Barcelona, in Spain. Uh, I also I wrote a book and uh, I took part on Angel Hack on the on it's, it's kind of a hackathon. Uh, we we won the 2015 local edition in Barcelona, and after that, uh, me and some of my colleagues are actually working uh, not working but uh, collaborating as ambassadors. For, for the Barcelona and trying to promote uh, startups and, uh, and hackathons. That I've been speaking in Java One, I've been speaking in, in, uh, in Java conferences in, Bar in Barcelona, in, in Droidcons, uh, and also recently I've been speaking in the, in the Mobile World Congress in Shanghai. Uh, also, you can see, okay, what's my interest in bytecode? Okay, in my background, I came from the demo scene. I don't know, is anyone familiar with the demo scene here? Great, one. Uh, demo scene, it's, uh, it's quite popular, it's more popular in Europe than uh, here in the US. Uh, it's a series of uh, graphical uh, competitions that, that has to be in real time. So there was a lot of, uh, of, um, of limits and constraints. For example, you have to build a 4K uh, Windows binary only, and you have to generate everything. So really low level bytecode assembly, it's uh, kind of uh, in my background, let's say. Okay, I would like to talk a bit uh, the Java compiler. So we know we're building for Android, but at the end, everything is compiled by Java. So we know that, we get a Java file, we, we go through the Java C compiler, and we get a class file. And on Android, it's not different. We get the Java to the class form the same way, and uh, the class to Dex. And then depending on if it's uh, Dalvik or if it's Art, you can convert it to uh, optimized Dex or a native file using the Dex to out. Okay, so change is coming. So Google announced Jack and Jill, but yeah, uh, they're gone. So, <laughs> <laughs> so change is coming, but not Jack and Jill. I have some examples on Jack because it was solving some of the issues. So I will still use them, but uh, be aware that uh, Jack is uh, deprecated since a few uh, months ago. So the idea about Jack, and we will see why, is uh, to convert directly from Java to the next file. So not going through Java C. Okay, so what was the, the problem with Java C? So let's compare it with uh, other compilers. So we know when we compile in C or any other compiler, it produces the code which is optimized for the architecture is, is actually it's gonna run. But in Java, it doesn't produce optimized code. Why? Because it doesn't know where it will be executed. So Java is, uh, you know, build once, uh, run everywhere. Uh, and this, Plenty of machines. There's plenty of architectures. Uh, you got uh, devices with ARM, with MIPS, with Intel, and many others. So at the point that Java is compiling, it doesn't know where, so it doesn't make any assumption at all. So uh, all the Java operations, as it doesn't know anything about the machine is going to run, it's basically a stack base. It's very easy to interpret, even for low-end machines, but it's from performance point of view, it's not the best solution ever. So let's do a quick example. So let's do a, a, just a, a quick addition. J and, y and, and I are integers. So on Java, it will be, I don't know if you're familiar with bytecode, but it will be basically loading into the stack, one, one variable, loading the other one, adding them, and then storing the result in, uh, in, the, in, in J, actually. OK, that's quite, quite easy. But here you can see it doesn't assume number of registers, doesn't assume anything about the machine. On a register-based approach, it's easy. To you are familiar with Intel assembly, that will be, or uh, ARM or similars will be that one. OK, just one single instruction to do what it was five, six or before. OK, but let's make things a bit more interesting. So this is a bit more complex operation, probably whatever we do every single, every single day. Uh, the bytecode for that, OK, it's a bit more interesting. So we can see here, it's loading the, the two variables, J and I, adding them together, same as before. It's keeping the result on the stack, and then it's loading K, 
adding it with the previous result from the stack and keeping the result again on the stack. The same with uh, W. And here it gets a bit more interesting. It loads H. It, uh, it pushes a number two on, on the stack, multiplies it, so it multiplies basically H by two, and then the result adds it together with whatever we got in the stack before. And with P, similar case, it's loading two times P, multiplying them together, and then adding them. And at the end, it's just storing that uh, on J. If we do that on our register, OK, it's not trivial, but well, trivial, well, well it's quite trivial, but uh, it's very simple. It's a bit simpler than before. So the only one that knows where is actually executing the Java code is the Java virtual machine. So in, in this case, for example, we use up to eight registers. But for example, what would happen if we, I don't know, if we try to run this, uh, this code on a Commodore 64, just to say something. I don't actually know there's a virtual machine for Commodore 64, but if that would be the case, a Commodore only had three different registers. So this will be quite uh, messed up. And all the optimizations and everything that needs to be to actually run on the, the best way they can, it's left to the Java virtual machine. But from a point of view, it takes the concept a bit too far. So let's see. We have this simple, very simple C code. OK, nothing really hard. Uh, we compile with GCC, uh, you, well, using the minus O to compile options. Uh, you can see it's easy, it's just, OK, it's 31, printed 31, easy. What happens with Java? OK, uh, we saw there's a, it pushes the 10 on the stack, stores it, pushes the 21, loads the variable it just store, adds them together, and then stores again. OK, you can see uh, on a compiler can actually do two different assumptions. First of all, A is not used anywhere in this scope, so there's no point on storing it and loading it again. And the other is, OK, we can just add them together. There's no point on uh, having those options. But let's do a small change. So what happens if we move the A from the end to here? On GCC, it's OK, 31, it's the same thing. But in Java, it's when things get it's getting interesting. So let's see. Uh, first of all, it pushes to 10, stores it on a, on a store. Uh, sorry, on, uh, on the variable, same as before. Then it's pushing 15, which is basically is from 1 to 5. It's loading the, vari uh, the variable A, which is the, the same way, uh, the 10 basically, adds them together. Then it's pushing 6, and it's adding them together. OK, so we can see there's a bit of a. Uh, but what happens if you put the A at the beginning? Do you think it will be simpler, more complex? Actually, it's quite, uh, quite a mess. So it seems that the Java preprocessor, or I don't know if there's a preprocessor there, uh, it stops at the first thing. It doesn't actually know how to inter interpret at that point. So if we look here at the code. It basically it, it loads uh, 10, uh, sorry, pushes 10, stores it, then puts 1, adds 1, 2, uh, 3, 4, 5. So it adds every single number. So it seems that the point that it doesn't know the way to interpret that, it just stops. And uh, it just translates as everything. But on Android, the, when you compile it with Jack, there was it was basically it's solving it was solving the issue because you do that with Jack and disassemble the file afterwards, you basically get that. But you com you don't compile with Jack basically in your dex file, you will get that bytecode on, on the dex file. And on Java, imagine uh, outside Android on Java, there's the JIT compiler. So uh, whenever we you get to the disk code and you disassemble the output of the JIT compiler you basically get that. So, OK, so all the optimizations are done basically by the virtual machine. So language additions, it's, uh, you know, there's a, it's plenty of language additions. So uh, it's, we have to consider and we have to use them wisely. For example, autoboxing, it's transparent, it's nice, it's, it's, it saves us a lot of a boiler, boilerplate code. But I saw that in some of my previous companies, one of my developers did that. So well, I will put just an example, just a, a single loop. OK, uh, we start uh, with uh, just it's storing a 0 in, um, in variable number 1, which is the total. Then uh, it's storing 0, which is the index on number 3, which will be the, the i. Then th this is the, the check of the loop. Basically, it loads the index which you store, which, which is on 3. Then it loads n, which is the, the, that. And then compares. If it's greater or equal, it jumps out, out of the loop. To increase the, 
the counter of the loop, it's easy, just um, increase the, the, the local variable number three, which is what, what we store here as the, the index by one, and that's it. The loop itself, and, um, and actually the content of the, the loop is not that complex, so it's, it's, loading, uh, it's loading the total, and it's loading the, the integer, which is actu actually the, the index, is converting to long, so Java is strongly typified. You cannot add uh, an int to a long. You have to convert it to long. And then it's, it's a long add, so it's adding two longs, and then storing the, the result. OK, so far, so good. But that is basically what the so wants. What happens if you do that? OK, bad code is a bit more bigger than that. OK, uh, it doesn't fit on the screen, but <laughs> sorry about that. I, I needed actually more screens to, to put all the, all the references there. But just going quickly to that, so you will see what it's actually doing. Is first, uh, it's loading a zero, and then it's basically calling long value of. So what is that doing? It's creating a new long object with a, with a value zero. And then it's storing it on, on a local variable one. For the index, same thing. So it's basically you, just doing an integer value of. So it's creating a new integer and storing the result. For the loop check, OK. Basically, we, we get, it, it's getting uh, the integer we just stored. It's getting the int value, so it's getting the, the actual value. Then it's pushing n and then comparing with n. But you can see there's a, a lot of extra operations there. The loop is the same thing. And the loop itself, the content, you can see it's, uh, it's, loading the, it's getting the long value of the total. It's getting, again, again the int value of the, of the index, so it's getting the primitive types. It's adding them to, well, it's comparing to long, adding them together, and then to store the value, it creates a new long, so long value of. Uh, to increase the loop, that's also a bit, uh, is not as easy as before, same thing, so it's getting the in value, adding one, and then storing a new integer value. And then I don't know why we have some extra bytecode that uh, basically uh, it loads the, the index before inc increasing, it stores in a different variable, then uh, here, it's duplicating whatever's what on the stack, so it's getting, it's getting the new uh, increased uh, index. It's turning it on a new variable, then it's loading it again, and then it's popping it from the stack. So basically, this instruction doesn't do anything. So I don't know. Uh, I, promise you, I promise you there was nothing below this code, so there, there's no point in doing that. And this is basically what they're doing. So I guess uh, no one will actually write a loop like that. And one of the problems is not only the performance, but the problem is also in the memory and the memory pollution. So we are corrupting, well, we are polluting quite a lot uh, the garbage collector with all the new objects we are creating here. So what about Jack? Does Jack solve uh, this? No. So Jack doesn't go that, that, that far. And what about the JIT compiler? So let's see how it behaves. So let's, let's run both loops. So the, the integer ones, and the, the one, sorry, the one with the primitives and the one with the, with the wrapper classes, and see what's the result. You can see it takes a bit more time. This is on a desktop machine on, uh, using the wrapper classes. Not sure if it's because of memory, garbage collection, or everything, basically. Uh, but let's try it on Android. So uh, we got two devices, one with Dalvik, still with Dalvik, another one with Art. And using primitives, it's quite, uh, you can see Dalvik is a bit slower than Art, okay, makes sense. But using wrapper classes, uh, there's, a big, uh, there's quite an impact on, on Art, but on Dalvik, it's a huge penalty. So you're still using Art, uh, sorry, you're still using Dal uh, or any application with on Dalvik devices, be very careful with that. So language editions, use them very wisely. It's always good to know what's going beyond, behind. So as we're talking about primitives uh, and uh, wrapper classes, it, this is no bytecode, it's, uh, it's just a, uh, just shoot on the whole thing, yeah. So let's serve some numbers. So there's no bytecode involved here, just, uh, just to see a bit of difference again with uh, wrapper classes and primitives. So just using a rise of sort, okay? But what's the difference if you want to sort primitive types or want to sort uh, an array, for example, of, of wrapper classes? Well, it's not only that the wrapper classes takes a bit more time, but actually it scales exponentially. Okay, uh, I don't think a mobile, uh, a mobile apps, at least not, not nowadays, you will be sorting uh, seven million numbers, let's say every frame. But uh, I guess it's worth not noticing the difference. So the difference is that, uh, that sorting objects is a stable sort. So in this case, it's a, it's, it's a team sort adaptation. And, uh, oh sorry, a stable sort, basically, if two objects uh, 
have the same key, it, it preserves the, if they are pre already sorted, it preserves that, that, that order. On primitives, it doesn't need to be a, a stable sort. For example, you have two fives, one next to the other. It doesn't matter if they end one next to the other or the other be, uh, just, just, well, if they change the other. It doesn't actually mean anything. So in this case, it's using a dual pivot quick sort. Okay, so again, use primitive types as much as you can. Just a bit about loops. Okay, so uh, let's see we have uh, this loop with a, with a list. It's an array list. Uh, it just iterating through the list and, and summing all the, all, all the numbers. Okay, uh, we'll go quickly to that. Uh, we can see basically the code is just, it's getting the list, it's getting the, the element with the array list get. It's checking if it's an integer, what else can be an array of integers, I don't know. Uh, then it's getting the in value, like before, converting to long, adding them together, and then storing the result. Okay, for checking the, the size, same thing. So getting the list, getting a, uh, calling the, the size method in the array list, and then comparing and jumping. The increasing, pretty simple, just increasing a constant number two by one. Okay, let's use a, a for each loop. So you know, uh, I guess most of you know that the for each loop basically using a, an iterator. And here we can see, so for example, this loop basically translates into uh, iterator.next. It, it, again, it checks if it's an integer. Then it gets the in value, then stores, and, and the condition is basically checked on the iterator has next. The loop itself, it's easy, nothing different. Using an array. Okay, here you can see there's a, there's a bit less bytecode already. Uh, and checking that, okay, we get the array, we get the index, and this basically loads the, the element of the array based on, on that index. So, and then it's combining to long, adding, and storing. Uh, here, basically, it's getting the array. There's actually a bytecode to calculate the array length, and then it's, it's just checking and jumping. But uh, as we know, probably the array length, it won't change during this loop. So what happens if we actually store it in a variable? So basically, this check, it now it's smaller. So it doesn't have to load the, the array and calculate the size. So it's, it's already on, on a local variable, okay? And as we know, uh, on IT, we compare with zero. Usually, it's faster, so simpler. So let's do the change, and let's, do the, let's put the, the, the loop backwards. So we do that. The check is simpler. So now it just loads. So you can see that now it's decreasing. And uh, what it does for, for checking the loop is just loading and checking if it's uh, greater than zero. If we check those loops, on, uh, so we, we get, uh, if we don't take into account lists or, or the proper classes, we check that, we can see, oh, sorry, that was wrong. Uh, those three are, sorry, uh, when iterating lists for each elements are a bit more complex. Uh, it takes more time. Uh, and also the for each is the one that has a bi uh, bigger penalty. On a, on a Nexus 5, it's more the same thing, but the penalty is, uh, is way bigger using a for each element, uh, sorry, a for each uh, loop. Okay, let's now do a, a for each loop on, on an array instead of on a, on a list. So now it's not using an iterator. So now it would just uh, do just normal plain bay code. So uh, I put here all the, all the constants so we can keep track of what's going on. So first, it loads zero and stores zero in, in the in local constant, in constant number one, which is the result. Then it gets uh, on well, when we have uh, a method on a, on a constant zero, we get the parameter the parameter, for example, in this case. So it loads array and it stores it on, on six. Why I don't know because it's array in zero. So we get the array length and we store it on, on constant number five. And then we start on constant number four uh, at zero, which will be basically the, the array loop, so the index. The loop itself, it's loading four, which is the loop index. It's loading five, which is the right length. It's comparing and jumping, okay? Uh, the loop itself, okay? We can see it, it's loading uh, the array, which is six. It's loading the, the index, which is in this case is, is in four. Then it's, it's getting the, the index, uh, as a, as a, it's getting the, the value from the array and it's storing it on three. So that would be that one. Then it's loading from, it's loading one, which is the result. It's loading from three, which is the, the, current, uh, the current element we want to add. 
it's converting to long, it's adding them together, and then storing it again on, on, on one, which is the result. To increase, easy, just increase constant number four by one, okay? And this is the whole loop. We do that, and we just get rid of all the, all, all the list on, uh, on, uh, on wrapper classes. We see that for each loop, it's, uh, it's the faster one in this case. So we're using primitives for each is, uh, is uh, the reasoning, I don't know, but seems to be a bit faster than using just a plain, uh, a plain loop. Uh, and actually, if we saw going backwards, it was the one with less instructions, but uh, we have to be very careful with that because we uh, probably, uh, we are killing our cache. So that might be the reason of doing, uh, this is taking so longer. Uh, but what happens if we run in a, in a Java device which doesn't have any, any JIT, for example, topic? Things are the other way around. So in this case, the faster one is, is the one that goes backwards because there's a huge penalty on uh, interpreting the Java instructions or Java bytecode. So as again, use a race as much as you can instead of list. And you're using list, try to avoid the for each uh, operator. Okay, uh, I went beyond because uh, I've been, we have actually been going through this bytecode and uh, there's a lot of loads and stores that doesn't actually make any sense. So if we manually optimize this bytecode, will it have any impact? I just tried once, I didn't, I didn't do it before, but, but so this is the, the loop we, we, just, we, we just saw. If we remove all the loads and stores, it doesn't make any sense. And for example, we can keep the result on the stack until the end of the loop. So there's no point of storing and loading, storing and loading. Uh, and let's a bit just go through it quickly because it's a bit more complex than that than before. So first it's uh, loading the, the right line on three. It's getting the index on one. Here it's loading the constant zero, which will be the result on the stack. So you, you see it's just loading, so it's pushing it on the stack, but it's not storing anywhere. And inside the loop, it's loading the array, which is in zero, it's loading one, which is the index. Then it, it's getting the, the element from the array, and it's adding them together with the two elements that are on the stack, which is basically result and the index. So it's just adding them together. The result, it's left on the stack, so we get uh, the new result here. Okay, so this loop, uh, it can be, maybe there's no point in storing the index, but it was quite messy just playing with the stack to have the right elements at the right place. Uh, and just increasing, it's just easy as increase that. So if we take a look at the performance, if we have a device with a JIT, so uh, it doesn't make any sense, so it's the same thing. But if we have a device without a JIT, actually the, there's, a, there's a bit of impact because as I said before, there's huge impact on the bytecode and interpreting the bytecode. So the less amount of bytecode you have, better. But is it worth it? Well, as I said, on very specific, rare, unique, uh, peculiar, special, I don't know if you have more words for that, but uh, no, it's too much effort involved, honestly. And also, if you want to do to go that performance, please use another language. So that's, okay, that's, uh, there, w there was something that uh, someone asked me one time, is there any penalty you call a method? Okay, so let's do a quick test. Uh, for example, this is uh, just getting, a, just, just setting uh, adding plus one, or just calling a setter and getter, okay, whatever. Uh, and the final idea is no, there's no penalty, just in one case. No. So on art, it's not worth uh, the difference. On desktop, there's basically zero. But on Dalvik, there's a, there's a big penalty. Okay, so I think we all played with the able plus sign when, uh, concaten uh, when, uh, concat concat uh, when doing a string concatenation. Uh, so I actually saw that as well in, in, in some, um, some codes, which it can be fine but it isn't. So you can see, well, when you use the plus sign, uh, most of you know that the uh, Java is translating that into a string builder, which is fine. But using that inside the loop, it's wrong. Because doing that, basically what you do, okay, let's create a new string, sorry, let's keep the loop thing. So inside the loop, what you do is basically creating a new string builder. You do an append with the, the string you just have there you do another app and with this other string we, we want to, to add, basically. And uh, at the end, we get a new string by calling a string builder to string. So basically, this is the code that is generating. And 
again, on, on the same thing on the, as, uh, as pollution of the garbage collection, we actually, well, the garbage collector, we're actually creating a, a new object here, and we're creating a new object here inside the loop. So, okay, so what are the alternatives? Okay, easy. Uh, string concat, okay, not the best idea, but might work. Problem is, basically, it's getting one string, getting the other string, and then it's returning a new string object. So again, it's here it's creating a new object every single time. Uh, but the nice, the nice way is using string builder, but using string builder the right way. What does it mean? Uh, just create the object before the loop, and then just, just doing an app in here. Uh, internally, it creates a buffer. It, it allocates more memory, but it's managing, it's managed internally. So it's not something to do with the garbage collection. No, sorry about that. So we check easily that. Uh, we can see the bytecode now here is just getting a, the other string and just called the method append. So it's more straightforward. And here, object creation only before and after the loop, so not inside the loop. So use a string builder properly. Uh, or string buffer, you need a thread safe implementation. OK, something uh, I actually never used. Uh, but it's there. You can use you can do switch with the strings. Is anyone using that? Okay, just one. It's a good sign. Because I was I don't know. I, I'm, call me old school or vintage, but I still prefer enumerations or use constants. But it, I don't want to go through all the bytecode on that. But if you look here, you can see he's doing here a switch internally in bytecode, and he is doing another one. Okay. So we can check why is two switch if there's only one here. Easy, because what it does, basically, it creates the, the hash. So this is the, I translated the, the bytecode to the proper Java code. So it, creates, it, it gets a hash code, and then it does a switch on the, on, the, on the hash code. So in this case, for example, it, it, it matches this hash code. Then it checks if the string is actually the string, because it can be a, can be a clash of hash codes, might be. And then it's setting a variable to a number, to a constant. So in this case, it's 0. Or in, the, in, the, in, this, in this case, it's 1. And then what it does, it does another switch with the, with the numbers. Why? I don't know. But just, I mean, it's not a big performance impact, but just to be aware of what's going on uh, when you're doing a, a switch on, uh, on strings. So a bit about tooling. OK, so you want to disassemble a class file, you can use Java P. It's not the, the most, uh, let's say, user-friendly tool in the world. But you, it gets the, the job done basically. On Android, you can use dex, you can use dex dump to just dump all the dex because you can see dex bytecode is a bit different than, than Java bytecode. So you want to build Java uh, bytecode by yourself. I, I actually use the disassembler on my case. I came from, as I said, I came from a, from assembly, from Intel assembly. I've been doing a lot of things, that, but Java bytecode manually, it's it's not something I really enjoy doing that. Uh, to disassemble and actually know what's going on on art, for example, uh, you, you can pull your you can pull the files. Be careful; you have the application running because you're constantly developing it. Uh, this number might change, so you can need to, to check which is the right file. And then on Mac, you get the object dump; it dumps the, the file. It's not as well; it's not user friendly; it's not easy to understand. It can be done the same thing in one single operation. So doing that, it dumps all the information already, and yeah, it's quite uh, hard to, to understand. Also, you're doing that on Java. I want to see what the JIT is producing. You can actually use it with the print assembly and, uh, well, command line print, blah, 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 all the tests. There was an, uh, you were, I'm more interested on that. There's, there's, there was a talk on, uh, on Java 1 last year about the, well, how uh, actually the bytecode gets translated into, uh, into assembly code. So it's quite interesting. Uh, please go there if you would like to, to know more information. So but I've been talking about that, but uh, I recommend always measure. Because if you optimize things, not always, uh, the result is not always what you expect. So one of the things I was doing in the past is uh, I was doing a, well, uh, a YUB to RGB converter. I know. It, it, the most efficient way was done in C and then later on, on ARM assembly. But at this point, I was doing it in Java just to see what's the impact on performance. So the nice thing with that is uh, the, the frames, that the, all the video frames, for example, 900 should come on this format. And it's using uh, all the Ys are the, the gray or the intensity of the, of the light. And then you get the U and the, and the V below. So it's two buffers. 
uh, you get all the color information there. So, but yeah, you want to, to render that to screen or to convert it to bitmap, you need to convert it to RGB. So to do so, okay, this is the code. Uh, I will not go into detail, but just will show that uh, uh, there's some plenty of uh, floating point operations to convert all, all the numbers or all the colors. And uh, it, yeah, it can be quite optimized. So if you optimize the, this code, for example, we can do pre-calc tables. We use fixed point operations instead of floating point. Uh, and as, uh, oh, yeah, something I didn't say. Uh, there's basically this sharing, so some uh, color intensity, they're sharing uh, the, the color information. So the buffers are a bit smaller. And as we are sh uh, they're sharing basically that information, we can actually calculate two pixels per every single loop. So, uh, so we do that, this is all the, all the pre-calc tables. For example, here is calculating all, all the values. These are all the floating multiplications you saw before. This is converted to the fixed point. And, and here it's just all the calculating all the minimums and maximums, so we don't have to do checks and we don't have to do ifs inside the code. And this is the new code. Uh, okay, so it's getting everything from tables, and here you can see it's getting one pixel using the the first component of the y, and the other one. So it's getting the two pixels using almost many operations. Okay, so this code actually is faster, but. Uh, Let's compare it uh, when we built uh, with, an, uh, with a normal build, a minified build, a minified using a, just Progart, minified with optimizations. There's a, there's a flag you can set more additional optimizations, and with Jack. So if we compare this loop, what, what it takes, or the amount of time it takes, you can see the non-optimized version, it's quite something we, we, we would expect. So the, the first one, the normal, no, no minification, no optimizations, it takes, okay. Then minify takes a bit less, which is okay. It's all right. Program um, remove some bytecodes and it, it, be, it, it is more efficient. If we, if we activate the optimization flags, okay, it's a bit more aggressive, so it's a bit a bit more optimal. And then uh, on Jack, okay, it's way more optimal. Okay, makes sense. But if we go for the optimized version, you can see there's not that much difference. But what I would like to remark is here that uh, the non-optimized version is faster than the optimized version. Why is that? I don't know. So uh, I guess, I don't know if there's a penalty on, uh, on accessing pre tables or accessing arrays or something. And it's something, uh, yeah, I was wanting to, to actually spend more time on that, but yeah, Jack is deprecated, so I don't think it, it's worth it. But uh, I think it was something quite curious. It was like, okay, let me just check again. I did something wrong. I check it again. Okay, let me check it again. I'm sure I'm doing something wrong. I have, I don't know, a download a place or on the background. No. So I don't know what, what was wrong there. So, and when doing performance tests, one advice is uh, be careful with the JIT, because if you run multiple tests at the same time, or you run just a batch of tests, the JIT might uh, pre-optimize that, uh, that code. So the first time it can take, I don't know, maybe it takes 200 milliseconds, and the next time it takes only 100. And so, oh, well, now it's faster. No, it's not faster. It's the JIT that optimizes the code. So you have to be very careful with that. And with that, I hope you actually don't fall asleep with all the bytecode now after lunch. But uh, yeah, if you need more information, uh, please let me know. Stay in, stay, in, uh, stay in contact. I would really like to involve uh, a bit more what's going on in Kotlin. So I talked yesterday, quite interesting, and I would really like to, to invest and check what's going on. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>